continue uh, reading Psalms 119, verse 137 through 144. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all things. Again, we are going to be continuing our study through Ephesians 1, verses 5 through 10. But before we can do that, we must do what we always do, back up before we can move forward. And, and last week, we made our way through verses 1 through 4, and we learned last week that Paul is the author of this book, Ephesians. Not only is he the author of it, but he penned this letter while he was in jail in Rome between sometime between 60 to 62 AD. Now we know that Paul, of course, did not start off as a Christian. He was a highly educated Pharisee who was part of the Sanhedrin. Now this we know about Paul. Paul hated Jesus. He hated his followers. And because of his hatred towards Christianity, he had made a name for himself by going after Christians and persecuting them. Now Paul was on his way to arrest some more Christians in Damascus when God knocked him off his horse. Not only did he knock him off his horse, but he blinded him. And it was there in a vision that Jesus revealed himself to Paul. Now let's pause just for a moment here, okay? Because we're going to be talking about some words today that, that ruffle the feathers of some believers. The words that we're going to be looking at are predestined, chosen, election, adoption. But, but let's pause right here for a moment, okay? Because at any point in time, do you think that Paul is riding to Damascus and chose for God to knock him off his horse? I would say not. At any point in time, did Paul look at, at the vision of Jesus before him and say, Jesus, you're stomping on my free will by doing this? No. No, it was because of that act. It was through that act that God regenerated the heart of Paul. And, and you, you have to understand this, church. Paul would have never chose Christ. He despised him. So you see this gift that God gave Paul that very day. Okay, now, now back to this understanding. So, so once Paul was regenerated... He disappeared for three years. We know that Paul went off into the deserts of Arabia where he studied the word. And it was after those three years he returned and he began pastoring a church when the Holy Spirit called him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now this, this is something else, church. Here you had this man who hated Christ, hated his followers. He was part of the Sanhedrin. He hated the Gentiles, that being the non-Jews. And here the Holy Spirit working in him draws him to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Now we know that Paul would be beaten throughout his ministry, arrested throughout his ministry. And that's exactly what happened this one time. Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for again preaching the gospel. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, 
and the Jews wanted to execute him, yet they didn't have the authority to, they sent Paul back to Rome to stand trial. And it was while Paul was under house arrest that he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus to do what? To encourage them. That's what the letter of Ephesians does for us today, church. It encourages us. And yet again, it's probably one of the books that is left out in most churches. But it is a book of encouragement. Now Paul starts the letter off by introducing himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So what is Paul letting the people know here? Paul is letting the people know that he was not a self-appointed apostle, but that he was elected to be an apostle by God's sovereign will. We're also told in this letter that this was directed towards the saints. And we talked about this last week. Who are the saints, church? Every single believer. If you are a believer in here today, you are a saint. You do not have to be voted upon to become a saint. You do not have to perform some type of miracle to become a saint. You, O oh believer, are a saint. He goes on to say in the letter, the saints should praise God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ for their faith in the Son. And that is so important because why are we to praise the Father and the Son for this faith that has been given to us? Because that faith wasn't in you, oh wretched believer. No, it was given to you supernaturally by way of the Holy Spirit. For the same Holy Spirit who dwelled in Jesus while he walked the earth during his earthly ministry, if you are a believer in here today, that spirit is dwelling with you. The same for the church in Ephesus. Now, something else that we learned from the verses last week was how that supernatural gift was determined to go to each individual who, who, who were the ones who were going to receive this gift? Was it because of something that they have done? Did, did God look down the quarters of time and see Sam and say, well, Sam just did a righteous act? Is that how that happens? No, because we're told that it was predestined before the foundation of the world, before the world was even spoken into existence. So how in the world could Sam do something if the world wasn't even created yet? In the Koine Greek, that being the original language of the New Testament, the word chosen is in the middle voice, meaning this is God's absolute independent choice so it was by way of God's grace and mercy his grace and mercy that's how he determined who would receive this regeneration this gift we also understand that there was nothing outside of God that swayed him one way or another on whom he was going to choose. So why did he choose? He chose whom he chose for his own glory, church. That's what the word says. I mean, it's, it's really plain how it's laid out before us. And, and yet there are a lot of denominations that despise this teaching. It has many of names. Calvinism. Doctrines of grace. Reformed theology. But really, it's just the writings of Paul. Paul. 
inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet this teaching has separated many of churches. Well, let's dive into it. Let's look at verse 5. Just right out of the gate, here we go. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You know what? I know this is hard to believe today, but there was a time when words actually had meanings. A word could be defined. Now, I know we are living in a post-post-modern world where we are taught otherwise. But if I may be blunt, the post-post-modern world is stupid. In the post-postmodern world, boys can be girls. Girls can be boys. Men can compete in women's sports. This is the post-postmodern world that we live in. And again, it's dumb. Common sense has been crushed at some point in the past 25 years. In this post-postmodern world, we have been told that there is no such thing as biological genders. Which again is stupid. Church, words have meanings. They still do no matter what the world may tell you. And the words that we are going to be looking at today are words from Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and also to us today, and he uses the word predestined, what does that mean, church? In the Koine Greek, that being the original language, you know what it means? Brace yourself. It's going to be shocking. It means to predetermine for ordain. Its usage in the original Koine Greek, I foreordain, predetermine, mark out beforehand. Hmm. So I guess predestined actually means what it says. And I would say, yes, that is correct. Before the world was spoken into existence, God the Father was going to send his son to rescue those whom he predestined to have faith in the son. Salvation was never an afterthought to God. This was his plan, and again, it was predestined. I mean, can you imagine... The almighty, sovereign, triune God sitting in heaven, looking down, Adam and Eve, and he's thinking he's really not going to take from that tree, is he? I mean, I told him specifically, not that tree. If he takes from that tree, what am I going to do? No. Believe it or not, God decreed all things. He predetermined all things. Thanks. Now we can't stop just at the word predestined. He then goes in and he uses the word adoption. He adopted his children. Now again, church, remember, words have meaning. Right? That's that's so important for us to remember today. When a child is adopted from an orphanage, is it the child who selects the parents? Is it the child who is sitting there interviewing the line of parents that are coming in? And the child goes, I'll take the Edwards. 
you can go ahead and tell the Smith, the, the Joneses, and the Johnsons, I appreciate them coming, but the Edwards are mine. Nope. It is the parents who choose the child. They adopt the child. It's their choice and theirs alone. It is God's choice and his alone. These words are not evil. They are wonderful, gracious, merciful words. Chosen, predestined, and adopted. Why are they not evil? Why are they gracious and merciful words? Because you would never have chosen Him. Bottom line. You wouldn't have. So He chose his adopted children. But not only did he choose them, he predestined those whose faith would be in his son before the foundation of the world. And why was this done, church? Continuing in the verse, it says, according to the purpose of his will. Listen, because this is so important. He did this. He saved the wretched because he wanted to. It was the purpose of his will. He didn't have to. He wanted to, church. And again, it's not because he saw anything through the quarters of time, something righteous that a man or woman did, and that's what got his attention. No. He didn't see man through the quarter of time, hearing the gospel, walking the aisle, accepting Jesus in his heart. And saying, okay, that's who I'm going to choose. No. God saved man, regenerated man's heart, elected man, predestined the day that he would rescue that the elect because it was according to the purpose of his will. It's all his doing, church. This shouldn't make us angry. This should give us joy. Because if God is perfect, He is, and God being sovereign, when He chose you, He did not make a mistake. And there's no way He is going to lose you. It's really a glorious thought when you think about it. Now, why did he adopt the elect? Look at verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace. Now, two questions before we dive into this verse. The first one. Does man deserve to be saved? The second one. Has the wretched done a single meritorious act for their salvation? The answer to both of those questions is no. Man does not deserve to be saved. And no, man cannot do a righteous act in his fallen state, meaning apart from Christ. We're even told our righteous acts apart from Christ are like that of a used minstrel rag to God. That's disgusting. And it's meant to be. Because there's nothing righteous about any work that we do apart from Him. I'm going to prove this again. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3. I read this last week, but now here we go. It's, it's, it just really tells you who we are apart from Him. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You understand that apart from Christ, you followed Satan, the prince of the power of the air. You weren't chasing after God. You were chasing after wickedness. Wickedness. 
And do you know why you weren't as evil as you wanted to be? Because of God's common grace. Even before you were rescued, His grace was being poured out upon you, keeping you from being as wicked as you wanted to be. Verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So before Christ rescued you, you deserved the wrath of God. Does that sound like anyone who is crying out to God? Who is seeking after Him? The answer would be no. Because that's what the scripture tells us. Now you see in verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace. Church, it was God who rescues the wicked. And when he rescues them, what attribute do we see of God? We see his grace. And what is his grace, church? It's God's favor toward the unworthy or God's benevolence on the undeserving. In his grace, God forgives his elect and he blesses them in spite of the fact that they have done nothing to receive it. This is why God rescues man so his glory can be shown throughout the world. He rescues fallen man so his grace will be glorified. That he will be glorified. This is why the believer cannot boast in themselves when it comes to their salvation because they've done absolutely nothing for it. Well, I walked the aisle. You may have walked the aisle, but it was God who regenerated your heart so that you could walk the aisle. How many have heard the illustration of the drowning victim from the free will perspective it it looks like this man's drowning in the ocean and and he's struggling he's bobbing up and down and every time he comes up he is just grasping for air yelling for help and there's a boat out on the water And, and the captain sees this man bobbing up and down waving his hands in the air and he and he pulls up to the man And the captain looks at the man and he says, look, I've got a life ring. I'm going to throw it to you. All you have to do is choose to grab a hold of it and then I will pull you in. Okay, that's, that's that's the free will illustration of it. So the captain throws the life ring. The man reaches out, grabs it. You see a synergistic exchange take place. The captain rows the man back in. The man's rescued. He's saved. Now, can can I tell you about the biblical illustration and how this works? Captain's in a boat. Just water. Miles and miles. Just water. Captain pulls to a spot. Nothing's going on. Doesn't see anything. But the captain dives in the water, swims to the bottom of the floor. There is a man dead on the sea floor. But church, not only is he dead, he's been dead so long that fish are now feeding on him. So the captain swims down, beats the fish away from him, grabs the man, swims all the way back up to the top, throws the man over his shoulder, climbs back into the boat, Starts performing CPR. Bum, bum, bum. Finally, the man pukes up whatever was in him. In that exchange, what did man do? Absolutely nothing. 
Who did all the work? The captain. The captain even knew where the man was dead. And he rescued him. Church, that's the biblical illustration of how that plays out. And what has God done by way of this salvific grace? Continuing, it says, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. By God rescuing his son, his his grace being exposed to the world, God is honoring his son through this salvific grace that he's given to the believer. This honors the Son. Every time a person is being rescued, it's an honor to the Son and what He did. Meaning the cross 2,000 years ago. Church, we have to remember on that day when He was on that cross bleeding out, what was the transaction that took place? Man sins, all of man's sins, that being the elect, they were imputed to Christ. So the wrath of God was being poured out upon him for the elect sin. But the transaction doesn't stop there because Jesus imputes his righteousness to all of God's elect, past, present, future, done. So Christ took the sin of God's elect and he gave them his righteousness. And church, that's what it means to be blessed in the beloved. You have his righteousness. You are covered in his righteousness. You have no sin to answer for because he took it upon himself that day on the cross. And now, believer, you too are beloved by God. And again, who did the work? What did you do 2,000 years ago? I hope nothing because you'd be really old by this time. But you did absolutely nothing. It was Christ who did the work, the sinless one. Meaning he was the one who fulfilled the laws of God. The very ones that every single one of us in here have broken. He was the one who was the perfect sacrifice. And because he was the perfect sacrifice, he could and he did pay the sin debt in full for God's elect. Was there any action on man's part? None. We have to grasp that Jesus is the only one who deserves the goodness of God the Father. But because of what he did on the believer's behalf, the believer now possesses the goodness of the Father just like the Son The believer now belongs to Christ. The believer is in the beloved. And if you are a believer in here today, listen, I don't care how often you may doubt your salvation. But if you are a believer in here today, you are in the beloved. It is a done deal. But understand that. What Christ did is finalized. If your faith is in him, your salvation is finalized. It is done. It is complete. Signed, sealed, delivered. Look at verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Now what does redeem mean? So often we hear these words, 
and they sound good, so we keep using them over and over, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we know what they actually mean. Remember, words have meaning. So what does redeem mean? In the primary usage of the scripture, it refers to buy someone back from slavery. Oh, Britt, you can't say that yet. Well, just did. That's what it means. It refers to the buy, to buy someone back from slavery. So to redeem the slave meant to buy them, to free them from their bondage of slavery. Now, church, this is extremely important because this is why Jesus says in Matthew 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So so this tells us who we truly are apart from Christ before he regenerates our hearts. We are a slave to sin. A sinner is bound to sin. Man doesn't become a sinner by committing a specific act. No, man commits specific acts of wickedness because they are sinners. So we in our natural fallen state from birth are in bondage to sin. And it affects every single aspect of our lives. Your very mind, your heart is in bondage to sin. And for man to be seen righteous in the eyes of God, what has to happen? You have to be freed from that bondage. But but man in their natural state, they don't want to be freed from it because they love it. So once again, we see the workings of God before the foundation of the world to send His Son, the Redeemer, to free His elect. To rescue them from that bondage. And we can't just skim over this We have to look at this seriously. And the reason why we have to look at this seriously is because it shows us how God hates sin. How he despises sin. I don't care what the sin may be. A little white lie, God hates it. He crushed his son over sin. And so often we're just flipping about it. It's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is a big deal. God killed his son to free you. Is that not serious enough? It irritates me because the so-called church today doesn't want to talk about that. The the church doesn't want to talk about how God hates sin. There's a reason why we have the commands. It shows us what God loves and it shows us what He hates. But the Western church, we go today to get a pep talk. Stay home and watch Tony Robbins or Joel Osteen. Listen, when, when you walk out of church, there's times where your feet should be like, I mean, they should feel like they've been crushed, stomped all over. Why? Because it's calling out the sin that you're still dwelling in, that you're dealing with, that you're fighting with. We we just treat sin today as if it's, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, continue to be part of the church while you live with your girlfriend. I know she's not your wife, but really, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, you're in a homosexual relationship? Oh, okay. You want to be a deacon? Or what about, um, oh, here's a good one. This always gets people riled up. So you're a, you're a female, and, and you want to be a pastor. 
What does the scripture say about that? But that's fine today. We just kind of let that, we just let that slide. God didn't let it slide. He killed his son. Is that something we should just gloss over? Ah, no big deal. It should make you sick. That the church has come so sissified that it's worried about being canceled? Listen, the, the Christian church has already been canceled. The world hates you. The United States hates you if you're in here today as a believer. Get over it. For the Western church today wants to hear about how great we are and how God loves everyone, that sin really isn't that big of a deal. I mean, today, can't the church just talk about salvation and skip over the redemption part? Let's just focus on the love. Sin is serious. Sin is serious because it separates man from God. That's how much God hates sin. There's a separation there from his creation. So you tell me how? Is man able to have a relationship with God if they're sinners and been separated from him? Church, that sin has to be forgiven. The bondage to sin has to be broken. And there's only one way that can happen. Let me say that again. There's only one way that can happen. Through the Son, the Redeemer. Notice once again, man is not mentioned when it comes to their redemption. No, it's through the Son. He's the one who frees the sinner because he spilt his blood. He died in the place of God's elect. He did that. He was the perfect blood sacrifice, church. He was the one who freed the elect from the bondage of sin through his death, burial, and resurrection. And what happened through his death when he spilt his blood? Look at verse 7. It continues. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So so do do we grasp why Christ died on the cross for the elect? For forgiveness. For the believer's trespasses, their sins against God had to be paid for. And the payment came by way of the son's bloody death. And through this death, through his death, came the forgiveness of God's elect. That's what the son did. He gave himself to fulfill the plan Of God the Father. Church, the perfect one had to be murdered. He had to receive the wrath of God on behalf of the believers. Why? So your sin debt would be crossed out. So you put Christ there on the cross. You you grasp this, right? And he did it for those who would believe, would experience God the Father's grace. They would experience, but the world would hear about it. But only the believer will experience the riches of his grace, his forgiveness. A grace that is eternal and everlasting. Do you understand that? That this forgiveness is eternal? That that your sins are gone? Every single sin is gone by what Christ did. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you go out and sin more. That's not what a true believer does. A true believer hates that sin, hates the very things that God hates. But, but when you think about that, 2,000 years ago, you are sin-free, debt-free because of what he did. I think we should talk about that more. Look at verse 8. Continuing, he says, which he lavished upon us. What, What did he lavish upon the believer? His grace and forgiveness. The believer never needs to worry that his grace is not enough. For a believer cannot out-sin God's grace. Nor, nor should the believer worry about God's forgiveness ever running out. For his forgiveness is final. It too is once and for all. For there is not a sin that a believer can commit that will cancel out the triune God's forgiveness. For you, O saint, have been lavished in his grace and forgiveness. Continuing, it says, in all his wisdom and insight. Now, this is God's wisdom and insight. Don't think this is something that that just popped up in your mind. No, this is God's wisdom and insight. This is some of the other blessings that come with you being regenerated. You've been predestined. You've been chosen. You've been elected. You've been adopted. And now you are receiving His wisdom and insight. Because now you understand. You understand why man is fallen. You now understand why it is that you need the Redeemer. And you understand that it is God who has given us His Son, the one who atoned for us. And without that atonement, what church, what else do we know? That man is left in their fallen state, and in that fallen state, they will meet an eternal damnation because their sins were not paid for. So you've been given that wisdom by God. You have this understanding of the word, but you have also been given the insight of God. And what is this insight? It is going to help you understand the issues of your everyday life. He gives us that understanding by changing our worldview. Every Christian should have a biblical worldview. Every decision that you make should be guided by the Holy Spirit through the understanding of the Scripture. I mean, it's all there. It shows us what it means to be a godly wife. It shows us what it means to be a godly mother. And those are for biological females, by the way. But it it also shows the man what it is like to be a godly husband, a godly father. How you are to treat your employees. How you are to act as an employer. These are the things that have been given to you. Look at verse 9, continuing and says, Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Now think about how God has revealed his plan of redemption to man. In the Old Testament, he started off with the ceremonial rituals, the sacrificing of animals to atone for man's sin. But but we see as the Old Testament progresses, more and more is revealed. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, here's the Son walking the earth, the perfect sacrifice once and for all. So you see how the sacrificial animals lead to the Son. 
You see how all the rituals lead to the sun. The moral laws lead to the sun. Ceremonial laws lead to the sun. The civil laws even point us to the sun. From old to new, more and more is revealed. And this is how God laid out his plan for man. This was his purpose. To eventually bring forth the Son so that the believers would see the great Redeemer. And that great Redeemer would live that perfect life. Go to the cross for that perfect death. And rise once again. And once that took place, then then what happened? Then the apostles would be sent out into the world spreading the good news. And every single aspect of the good news, every part of the Bible does what? Points us to Christ. And for us today, we have that entire word. Church, we don't need God speaking to us or giving us visions. We have His Word. Closing. Verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Church, God's plan and purpose It happened just as he decreed it. When we hear this word predestination, we must also understand that it's just not referring to salvation. But every single thing that takes place, every single thing has been predetermined. And even though it's been predestined, It unfolds in real time. From the creation of the world to the return of Christ, it's been predestined to unfold exactly like it is. And this should be comforting to us because there's not been a moment in time where God has been surprised by a single thing. And even today, in our own country that looks chaotic to us, it isn't to God because it's fulfilling His ultimate plan. That ultimate plan that eventually leads to the return of Christ. And when that happens, the entire world will know That he is king. And on that day when that happens, he will separate the wheat from the chaff. Uniting all things in heaven and earth. By bringing all the saints together once and for all to live in the new eternity, the new heaven and new earth. And know that every step of the way leading to his return has been decreed. It has been predestined. And this should bring comfort to all the believers here today. Knowing that there is no other option. That every single child of God will be redeemed. Not a single one will be left. And when the final one has been redeemed, Christ will reign on the new heaven, in the new earth, and his elect will worship him for eternity in perfect, holy harmony. We should rejoice in that. We should find comfort in that. The words predestined 
chosen election, adoption should not scare us. Again, it should fill us with joy, knowing that we serve the almighty, holy, sovereign, triune God. Let us pray.